What is good? We're back. We got Big Co and, and old CM in the in the satellite offices. Not in the, the not satellite. in the main not in the main studio. Uh, but we're, <laughs> we're we're getting her done anyway. Uh, today we're gonna go over some draft strategy. We got a, a mock draft, and we're gonna focus on uh, Big Co's team here from the one ten slot. You know, went in maybe going best asset available. Ended up with some running backs. I thought it was a good draft to kind of talk about stayed young and productive struggle ish but there's a win now kind of vibe to it a little bit you could go a lot of different ways with this draft so big coke take it away here on on what you were thinking uh from this 110 spot here yeah man thanks uh obviously you've got to be got to be able to stay fluid in your draft i want to come in thinking a couple of key elements to my draft i, I don't want to be it's a super flex draft tight end premium 12 teams, but I don't want to be too quarterback crazy, but just the way this, this set up, it is, is two flexes, not three or four flexes. So the quarterbacks aren't as washed out as much as we've talked about on previous shows. I want to win now, but I don't want to overload. I'm not going to say, I don't want to, I'm not going to draft a bunch of 30 year old guys. It's not like I want to win first year and then fall apart afterwards. I want to, I want to win with young studs as much as possible, of course. Um, right. And that should be obvious to everyone, but my third element here is just kind of I'm okay taking a running back early if and when it falls correctly. I'm not going to force it, but you know, all spring long, January, February, March, all that, it, just every mock that we've done, it's almost been like trying and trying to figure out how I'm getting my wide receivers early and, and working my tight ends and quarterbacks and then figure out where I will end up with my running backs when it happens. And that's kind of like my productive struggle angle is, is if I skip out on running backs, then obviously I'll have that hole in my lineup, you know, first season. And and then in the end of the draft, I'm loading up on running backs and maybe I won't have a hole in the lineup by the time, you know, week six or eight rolls, rolls around. But the idea is that my team is absolutely studded out without running backs. This yeah. draft right here, my mindset was I'm okay real, with taking a running back early. Yeah, re real quick. I mean, we'll, we'll do... We'll show multiple different ways. I I think what Big Co just alluded to is is become my favorite way to draft. I think it's the best way to do it right now because uh, the wide receivers are probably the second best type of currency in super flex tight end premium. The the, the tight end can be there, um, but uh, for the most part, everybody like loves the wide receivers. Um, so that's why we kind of singled in on this one. A little bit different approach of st still some of the same approach, and we'll talk about where the routes you could have went in different spots here, but we'll, we'll focus in on other teams in that strategy of a lot more uh, blue wide receiver boxes, maybe, maybe a different quarterback box or two, a tight end box or two, but then not a whole lot of running back boxes outside of maybe your bell cow one. And then don't just don't even think about it again for, you know, till round 13. Right. Right. Um, right. That, but that's not what we were, what we went here. And that's why we kind of wanted to, zoom in on this one a little bit just because it, it went a little different than normally would but, but i don't i don't i don't think i would be upset about it right you know i think this was still a viable option that you could know you could really do a lot of different go a different a lot of different ways with absolutely i mean i certainly didn't plan on coming into this draft and having you know um my fourth my sixth and my seventh round pick be be running backs like i said i was okay you know i'm not completely rushing off the running backs as I normally have been practicing startups this year, but I definitely had no intentions of just, you know, piling on running backs in the middle rounds there. But so I felt like the value fell correctly. And like I said, the first thing out of my mouth tonight was just trying to be fluid. I do want to be for the most part, best asset available. And we've talked about plenty of times in the past. I enjoy the trading aspect of the dynasty fantasy football. To me, that's one of the most favorite, my, my favorite part. Obviously we need to put together a lineup to win, but as I go through this, there's definitely some not fantastic picks in here. This is a mock with a timer and you know, you get, it's a slow mock, but you get working, you pull it up, but you know, all yeah, of a sudden you, you got trade, but we can talk you, a little no bit trades. About sure. Sure. I, I don't, I'm not sitting here saying, Hey, look at all these perfect picks I made, not by any stretch of the imagination. It's more like the thought process. It's, it's always as, the idea, right? It's not necessarily right. the players per se every time. Yeah, exactly. That kind of comes into play round six and seven with Jonathan Brooks and Trey Benson, for sure. It was the idea, the theology of it, if you will, the team build out. I I, I enjoyed it. You know, it was not something mm -hmm. I had been doing and, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. And then real quick before we start, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, I mean, here's 
Here's a team that I drafted. And it's the same thing that Big Co said. I made plenty of mistakes in this draft. If we highlight that team real quick, the theory of the boxes, right? Of yeah. quarterback, wide receiver, wide receiver, tight end, wide receiver, wide receiver, uh, quarterback. quarterback, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, then some running backs, right? And we hammer running backs. You know, I don't, I don't maybe I don't want to make that Kendra Miller pick, but the idea of just taking a, a, a running back there would be, in general, a lot of the times how I like to lean. Uh, so just wanted Absolutely. to highlight a different version of that. So um, coming over to the other side here, where, where Big Co started off, you had Anthony Richardson um, there at the 110 spot. Sure thing. And of course, you know, at, when one nine's on the clock, I'm like, all right, take anybody you want, but don't take Justin Jefferson, right? So Justin Jefferson goes in front of me. If it works out properly, I'd like to get a quarterback in the first three rounds in a super flex to not put myself behind the eight ball. But I'm been practicing all you know all year long uh for that not to be the case and i'm totally fine if it doesn't happen but i kind of want it to happen in this case it's at 110 i'm not passing up anthony richardson completely happy to have that absolute ceiling uh and he's he's super young he's a lot of fun head coach proved last year he's you know an elite head coach already first season just ridiculous play calling would mention you when richardson went out i uh, just listened to a uh, beat writer for the Colts today, actually talking about how they they're going to actually throw more than people are giving them credit for right this minute. The mm-hmm. Steichen wants the ball in Richardson's hand, so um, and that obviously that'll lend itself to plenty of quarterback rushing as it as it, even on the non drawn up quarterback runs. Could have taken Caleb, obviously. Really thought about taking him on or St. Brown, and knowing that you count the blocks right uh, you, when I'm at one ten. You got 11, 12, 2, 1, 2, 2, and I'm back on the clock at 2, 3. So there's going to be four players go off before I get to play pick again. If I take St. Brown, I'm definitely going to get a quarterback that I like. Somehow, some way, if Anthony Richardson, Caleb Williams, Kyler Murray, and Justin Herbert were those four picks, then you know I would have just been stuck with another good wide receiver. But mm-hmm. I took Anthony Richardson, and when it came back around, I was hoping St. Brown would get to me. He did not. And then the conversation, I think, is I took Puka over Marvin Harrison. A lot of people probably won't like that. Marvin Harrison's the coolest thing that ever happened. And he really is, man. He's a lot of fun. I got him on two teams right now from the rookie drafts this year. But, man, for me, Puka is just so nasty. He's dirty. We've seen him do it. I don't think there's any reason that I don't think many people at all expect uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. not to walk on the field and be ridiculous. But Puka, we've seen him be ridiculous. And he just, to me, just looks tough as nails when he's playing. And the word for this pick is investment. When you're making the pick, and it, it's the opportunity cost of what you could have done with and going any other route. So you're on the clock at 2-3. You have a quarterback in Anthony Richardson. You're looking. And you're like, am I going to take Puka? Am I going to take Marvin Harrison? Am I going to take B. B. John Robinson? Am I going to take Brees Hall? you know, Jordan Love, et cetera. And so when you make that selection and you pick a player, you 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 have invested that draft capital, that the second round, early second round startup pick in a player. The safety of Puka feels fantastic. I don't think there's any wrong answers for four more blocks. I took Puka. Marvin Harrison was next. Bijan Robinson was next. Brees Hall was next. So in my eyes, the easy way to play that is if you're on the clock at 2-3, you could trade back three spots and you can get one of those four players and you could probably get a really nice payment, a, a nice check written your way to back up off of that two, three, you can go to four or five, you can go to two, six and be guaranteed that absolute stud cornerstone player. Now, if you're not an early running back kind of guy, maybe you're backing up two picks to get Harrison for sure. Maybe you bring, maybe you're a Garrett Wilson kind of guy and that you add a third block there for the if you just have to have a receiver mm-hmm. um maybe maybe you bring jordan love into play if you're a quarterback man and if you're a jordan love bandwagon jumper owner like i am myself that's kind of where a trade that i could make there is trading back from two three being happy with the next four guys on the list there um those absolute cornerstone studs i just want one of them and i'm happy i got one of them you know Hey guys, a quick reminder to head over to patreon.com slash the FF Dynasty to sign up for a free membership to get access to the free Discord channel. Or hit your boys with the $5 holler and get access to extra shows, mock drafts, roster reviews, and also our 2024 Rookie Draft Kit, complete with rookie rankings, ADP, and player pages. All for your pleasure. 
if we're in a real draft here, depending on what you like there, you you could, uh, and, and it just happened to play out just like this. You you got Marv, Bijan, Brees, and I think you could, you know, some people, like you said, would would have Garrett Wilson in there. He just slipped in this uh, instance here, or if you were sure. a, a love guy. So there could potentially be, you know, four or five person trade back available there, uh, but obviously it's a mock, so. Yeah. And that's that that's, you know, when you're in your real startup draft this year, that's, that's always going to be the case. The problem is being able to stomach, not taking the guy you want. And when you find yourself in that window and you're like Puka, Marvin Harrison, if it's Gary Wilson, if it's just Puka and Marvin, it's just, you just, then you just trade back one spot. But if you're like, Hey, I could, I could be, I, I might want to take Brees Hall here and I really want to take Puka, but I want, oh, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to be, I, you know, screw it. I'm taking Brees Hall. Obviously, if you can't live without Brees Hall, just take him. But if you can, you know, if you can stomach any of those four guys, the payment that you could get to move back four spots there could be very, very worth it. And we'll have another show on the actual trades of that because it would take forever if we started doing hypothetical <laughs> trades tonight. Sure, sure. All right, so you you take Richardson, you take Puka. Now we're on the on the third round here. Uh, it's a third round reversal. So in the on the later picks, get a double down on the on the third here. Um, and you you get uh, on the reversal it goes Jaden Daniels, Gibbs, and then now you're on the clock at three three. What do yeah, you? Yeah, and I I opened my phone and I saw that three two was on the clock, and I was like, okay, good. I'm getting Gibbs or neighbors for sure. You mm -hmm. know, would have been fine taking Gibbs there, but it was kind of nice to to have to not have to make that pick. Uh, having him t you know snaked right in front of me opened it up to grab neighbors. It's you could easily say. Hey, there's Tyreek Hill. He's probably he's probably the the safest bet for the WR one season on the year. And you know he's talking about how his money don't go as far now that he's got twelve kids. <laughs> and if he's going to play two three years, he he's a good good bet for the WR one for two three years. So I could understand if people if that's their flavor. Um, to me, I'm going to take the 20-year-old neighbors and understand that I'm not getting as much weekly production as a Mar as a Tyreek Hill's giving me right now. I understand that. And Tyreek Hill could be the outlier. I've been, you know, he's ridiculous, obviously, but he's also just so tough. He's always, it, when he gets banged up, he comes back in all the time. So you just, he plays hurt. He's pound for pound. He's one, he's probably the toughest dude in the league, in my eyes, just watching watching games ridiculous it's hard not to take a guy like Tyreek Hill but he's 30 years old you know 20 years old 30 years old 10 year difference so I, I took neighbors there yeah I mean so really this this is is starting off like you know any normalish draft that that I think you, you and I would would have uh who, who employ the strategies and draft the way that we kind of do maybe it would have been two quarterbacks in some instances but uh starting off Richardson Puka neighbors you're you're in good shape you're young uh, you have a game-changing quarterback potentially, and then you have two wide receivers who everyone's going to covet and love. One has already proven that he's good. The other one, we're pretty sure he's going to be good. And you could, even if neighbors isn't on your team in uh, September or November, what neighbors can lead to is a stepping stone to uh, being able to go up into one of those top-tier guys like a Jamar Chase or a St. Brown or, or maybe a Garrett Wilson if you prefer him. Uh, but neighbors gives you a lot of flexibility there with the youth and what could be uh, to be able to do multiple different things with this build already. To be quite frank with you, pull back the curtain. Neighbors is a fun pick, man. Mm. He's a, he's just a fun pick. You know, he's that bright, shiny new object and he looks like he's a stud. The giants talk, there's, you know, video evidence of them saying they wanted to take him before they were on the clock, not knowing mm -hmm. who was going to be there. Hey, we would take neighbors first out of those three receivers. So says the wide receiver coach, you know, you, you elect the, 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 it, Purdy there. Good point that, that Purdy Purdy is the one guy that stands out on the page as just being like absolutely ridiculously good value. No matter what happens when you get that, that's why I said when I started like it in the first three rounds, I want to try to have a quarterback. And it's because in the first three rounds, you're almost always going to find yourself with a chance to get Purdy. Sometimes Dak falls that far. Sometimes Trevor Lawrence falls that far. Um, but Purdy, he just always makes it to the third round and it's, it's, yeah. a, it's absolutely amazing what he gets, what, you know, what he brings to the table. If you're um, three, six, three, five, three, four, like you, you can feel fairly kind and it's not going to happen all the time, but you can feel fairly comfortable that 
one of Lawrence, Dak, or Purdy it has been falling there in a lot of drafts that we're seeing. And this one, Dak and Lawrence did not. It only takes one person. But Purdy almost always makes it into that that third. Three, one to three, six is you can you could go wide receiver, wide receiver, running back, wide receiver, whatever you do. You could have Justin Jefferson and Bijan and then come in with Brock Purdy, right? Uh, so, I know, crazy. You know, he's if, he's such a such a value right now for what he could do to in the way to build your roster. Sure, and people may. I mean, the Niners, the efficiency that everybody's been talking about. If you click QBR for the season, Brock Purdy's at the top. If you click quarterback rating, Brock Purdy's at the top. If you click yards per game, Brock Purdy's right up there. He's he's you know top six. If you click touchdowns, he's right up there in the top. Uh, he's number three in touchdowns. Uh, he's number two, he's number five in completion percentage. And that with, but those, the yards per game, the touchdowns and the, the ratings and everything, all those are just an absolute top for Purdy. If you click attempts, he goes all the way to the bottom. He's 20th in attempts, mm-hmm. right? They just didn't have to throw the ball as many times because they was obviously they got leaning on Christian McCaffrey, but every time the ball came out of his hands, he did more with it per throw than anybody, probably in history. Like it was probably the most ridiculously efficient, you know, I, yards per throw. I mean, I don't think anybody's ever been better. I, that's just an absolute monster season. Um, you know, there's been a lot. There's players would have had a lot better stats, but on a lot more attempts. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, so stock up, Purdy. Yeah, I mean, I was just in the strategy hole there. Like, I, 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 we just finished up one, and I was at the one seven, and I started my draft Jefferson, Brees Hall, and then got Purdy, uh, Love where, it. where Drake London went in this one, and then you know Nico and and then Brock Bowers as you know those are my first five players, right? Oof, love that. Um, so you know you, you can you can he can kind of be your your savior of still getting a potential top five quarterback, but I think at a, at a baseline, a, a top 10 quarterback, right. And maybe not necessarily the game changer that you got with Anthony Richardson there, which I don't disagree with going with there, but uh, yeah. So just want to sh- shine a little light on Purdy. but you, you go neighbors here and then you, you come all the way back around and you take Kyron here uh, at the four ten spot. And, and this was probably a little bit change of direction here for you. Normally, not that I'm, I'm disagreeing with with the pick at all. I mean, some people are are going to be bent out of shape about that, but I mean, at the end of the day, Kyron Williams could be putting up, and he did, frankly, put up uh, Brees Hall CMC type numbers last year, right? So oh. everyone's just convinced that there's no way that that was a Fugazi, and I'm like, well, I don't, bro, I don't know about it. unless he's hurt. Uh, you know, I think this is a 18 to 21 point a game kind of guy. If he's not hurt. It absolutely is right now. Uh, I quoted a stat a couple of weeks ago talking to you on here, uh, and it's been a while, so I don't remember if it was number one or number two, but he was number one or number two in the league in opportunities into ten, into, uh, inside the 10-yard line, which mm-hmm. is you know a, a, a targets and carries. So when you're getting that kind of action uh, around the goal line, you're scoring points, and obviously the Rams offense comes into this year probably as, as as excited as we have been about them since they had like the girly season. Yeah. Um, and not, not just because I'm talking about Kyron either here. It's just because now you bring Puka in uh, beside Cooper cup and, and, you know, two years ago or so it was like, Oh, Sean McVay is going to retire, you know, or, or step away. Stafford, McVay's leaving. Stafford, Stafford was is retiring. Yeah, Stafford yeah. was out. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know how long Stafford is really going to play anymore. He got really crushed in Detroit for I think, a decade. I think Gave him a raise. You should give him a raise. So I I think, I I mean, the Kyron pick for me, obviously when I make that pick at 410, that is, like I said, I I, want to try to win this year, but he's, it's not like I'm locking in on a stud who's, it's not like I forced the Saquon Barkley pick, right? Saquon Barkley at 412. If Kyron, I mean, obviously Saquon changed teams to the Eagles and he's in a completely different environment right now. But Kyron, we're talking about somebody who was averaging 20 points a game last year. And now, you know, instead of me saying, oh, I'm scared of Kyron because they brought in Blake Corum. To me, it's like fantastic. It gives me the opportunity to buy lower on Kyron and then get a guy like Corum to just solidify that investment. Again, capital letters investment i mean this is still four if i know it's we're down to 410 now so some of the some of the cachets dropping a little bit some of that equity name value is dropping a little bit but 
at 410, when I make this pick, Nego Collins is on the board. Uh, Kyle Pitts still on the board, Devonta Smith, Tank Dale, uh, you know, all the young rookie wide receivers, except for the big three are still on the board. You know, Drake Mays on the board. I, I made an investment in Kyron, but this is my chance. I don't want to call it a home run cut, but it really is because he crushed it last year, stays in the exact same environment. And the rookie r- running back that they brought in is almost like a little clone and mm-hmm. I'm it's basically make this pick knowing that I'm going to get Blake Corum later. And in this instant, obviously you see my team right now and I've, I've ended up drafting Jonathan Brooks and Trey Benson here. But when I'm making this pick at 410, I'm like, all right, now I don't even have to worry about running backs for a while because I'm going to go get Blake Corum later. And I, that way I basically guarantee myself outside of wild injuries and, and having both of them get hurt guarantees myself an RB one, maybe a top five RB. If, if Matt Stafford stays healthy and the, and the offense does what we think they're going to do, you know, he was a top, he was a number two RB and PP, you know, points per game last year. So why can't it be top five? So, yeah, I mean, still four know. on the season, according to sleeper here and missed uh one, two, three, four, four games. <laughs> like, oh, then, total, you know, for sure. week 18 and, didn't play, you know, yeah, it's just, points it's, per game is off the charts. When your points per game is that high, you're exactly that that speaks to two things how how much Kyron dominated last year and how much the other running backs not named Christian McCaffrey didn't really score that much yeah. you know you know I, even Gibbs Gibbs came on super hard late but he started the season not hard you know as a rookie right. um but Kyron's look at the, you know on your screen right there you got it highlighted he's 23 years old like that's the right. whole mindset that's, that's, that's the that's whole mindset it. exactly you got Saquon Barkley over here what is he 28 you know, 27, um, 27, 27, 28, who knows? So only his mama, he's 23. And if all goes right, I got a stud and it later on in the draft, there's nobody else. There's nobody in the league that who's Blake Corum is going to, is Blake Corum is going to mean more to me than anybody else in this draft. So as my, as I draft the 410 of Kyron Williams, I have no intentions of drafting Brooks and Benson together, of course. Mm-hmm. So right. I'm like, I'm going to take, I'm going to take Kyron. I'm going to get, uh, uh, Blake Corum later, and then I can fill out my RB2, but that guarantees me a RB1. Kyron goes out, Blake Corum goes in the lineup. Yeah. No, and I mean, all, all the Rams did was upgrade that line and got even better, and, and they just came out with a whole new identity. So I I, I love it. Um, and then you, you know, you did, you do end up, spoiler alert, obviously everybody can see it. You, get, you are able to get Corum. So, like, that's the part that makes me comfortable and in really investing in, in Kyron Williams anywhere in this fourth round here. Definitely. Um, and, and being able to just say, Hey, worst case scenario, Blake Corum's playing because Kyron's hurt. Best case scenario. I've got a top three to five RB. And that that's, that's the kind of shit that wins you leagues, right? Everybody who right. like, Unless your team was absolutely dreadful. I mean, obviously, everybody told you to sell Kyron Williams last year. Um, but unless your team was absolutely dreadful, like Kyron took a ton of teams to the playoffs at the very least. Um, definitely. And now, definitely. Since, now, since they since a 23-year-old running back on a team uh, whose offense is just changed gears and just got better, at least offensive line-wise, is the, the, so all of a sudden he's going to be supplanted. And I just, unless there's injury, I just don't see it. So you take Kyron there, and then you come back in the in the fifth round here with the wraparound and go tank Dell, maybe over a couple other people that that some other people would be a little bit more comfortable with because of maybe their projected WR one role, not WR one point scoring, but WR one role like a like a DJ or a Pittman or or even a Pickens maybe. But Tank Dell, we know, has had stretches where he was averaging like something like seventeen point eight points per game. Uh, CJ Stroud loves him. You got Diggs there for a year, but take the Diggs discount on all these Texans and and get yourself some. I was just watching a clip today, and I don't know how old it was, but it was Micah Parsons and CJ Stroud, and they were on a podcast together, and they were talking about drawing up one play and putting their offense around them, and then Micah Parsons, it was fourth and three or whatever, and Micah Parsons had to put his defense on the field with whatever players he wanted and, right, like an um, all-pro cast, like right. at the best of and, every position. And, yeah, I've and, seen it. And, you know, C.J. Stroud, you know, not that I'm hating on Nico, but he puts 
Tank Dell in the slot, though. Well, you know. Well, yeah, but like, but the point is, he calls that. He's like, I'm gonna put Devontae Adams over here. I'm gonna put Tyreek Hill over here, or whoever uh, it was. You know, he's Chase. he's calling Jamar Chase. J- Jamar Chase, like he. So he's calling out the best of the best, and then in the slot, he didn't miss a guy. beat. He didn't smile. He didn't laugh. He didn't make mm-hmm. any excuses. He didn't. You know, he That's just was going. He loves him. That's his guy. That's his. And boy. I know that's I narrative. Just, I know it's narrative street, but the narrative street came fucking true as hell when Tank Dell was out there, and we we th- everybody's thinking this offense is going to take another step. So I'm rationalizing your your pick there for you. Sorry, uh, but no, I, that's it. I'm, I'm all in on Tank Dell. Yeah, I, I I was late to the party. Um, we had a you kept bringing him up last year and all the team all the rookie drafts that we had last year together, and I'm like, why you keep talking about Tank Dell? And thank God you kept bringing him up because we took him a couple times and. I wish we'd have taken him more. I'm all in on him now. Uh, that's, that's Stroud's boy, and that's all I need. That's, I'm good with that. He, he's yeah. Tank does a stud, and I, that the investment in that pick, there's there's a safety layer in that. Sure, do I think there's a chance this year that DK Metcalf explodes? Absolutely. Pickens, Pickens. could explode? Yeah. Absolutely. But there also could be some downside to that Pittsburgh offense that we don't want to talk about right now because we're all building them up because they're so cheap. Pickens might not be Pickens that we want him to be. To me, Tank Dale, that's like a that's like a fix it and forget it kind of guy in my lineup for like yeah. five years. Like that yeah. that's to me, I took that guy and he's on my team for a while and, and he's in my lineup every week. So I feel yeah. I I'm taking Tank Dale every time. And I would have no problem. My team would be fun too if I had Nico Collins in the Kyron Williams spot. Boom. Give me Nico and Tank Dale on the same team. No problem with that. Right. Uh and so then, you know, that round goes through, you come back, uh, you take Jonathan Brooks, and then you wrap back around and take Trey Benson. Uh, which you know, I I love those two picks. Like if I, as, almost regardless of how my build's going, like if I can get both of those guys in in the late sixth, early seventh, I, I think those are the running backs. Those are like probably my heaviest targeted uh, two running backs because the value is insulated. The value is going up for both of those guys. People are very intrigued, and by the end of the season, I think both of those guys' arrows will be pointing uh, straight up. So I, I I love those two picks uh, for you there. Yeah. That- and, that was when the get that was when the this team just got so fun for me. You know, you're looking at the team that you've drafted so far. I'm looking at I'm in I'm in the seventh round and I got Brooks and Benson back to back. I had no plans to do that, but the way the the board fell, Brian Thomas goes right in front of uh, Trey Benson. I could have easily taken Brian Thomas there, but you know every every startup there's going to be a team or two or three that comes out and they're just like loaded at running backs. And a lot of times that when they're loaded at running backs, they got to give up something else. And, you know, like the team beside me, they got Gibbs and Jacobs, the team beside that, Barkley and Cook, uh, Bijan and ETN, Christian McCaffrey, A-Chain. There's some te- teams that are loaded at running backs, and some of those guys aren't the youngest. Some of them aren't, you know, aren't the oldest. But for me, that get, I got three of them. Obviously, we, you know, Jonathan Brooks isn't going to be hitting on all cylinders week one, and Trey Benson's not going to be the lead dog for his team week one either. But let's say year two, in my team in this league, I, I I'm setting up to be a really nasty. You don't want to see me every week kind of a team. Of mm-hmm. course, at this point, I've only got one quarterback. I only have three receivers, but you, you know I got two receivers and Tank Dell and a flex, and I got Kyron Williams and Jonathan Brooks. Who Jonathan Brooks to me just represents when I see Jonathan Brooks as a, as the pick at six ten. I just see Dave Canal as hand picked running back. Mm-hmm. I don't even see Jonathan Brooks's name there. All I see is volume. Yeah, targets. I see. I Dave Canales. I see, Canales, I see Rashad White. You know, that's all. That's what I see. Him, him, it, and it, Brooks. I think Brooks is a better runner than Rashad White is. So, I mean, let me right. I see a twenty-one. I see a twenty-one-year-old Rashad White, White that got tr- drafted in the er, in the earliest part of the second round of this year's draft on a team that was absolutely horrible and had plenty of things they could have gone after other than a running back. That's what I see when I see Jonathan Brooks right there. I see Dave Canales planting his flag on his philosophy. We all made fro- front of him last year when he was talking about how much they, that uh, Rashad White was going to get the ball put in his gut, even if the defense knew it was coming, and we mm-hmm. made fun of him for it, and he turned Rashad White into an absolute workhorse PPR monster, and so I see that right there at pick 610. And, and then I get Trey Benson. Man, when Trey Benson breaks a long one in the preseason – this you're not going to be getting this cheap is mm-hmm. the people are going to be salivating for him. He's going to, his that, that Arizona offense is on the rise. 
And and this team, obviously it's a mock. This means nothing. But a build like this, as soon as I got Brooks and Benson back to back, this team became so much fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we got maybe 10 ish minutes here left. Let's let's get get the rest of this build out and then let's let's talk about a little bit more of the theory and the strategy of kind of what what you would do once once you're built kind of moving forward here. So uh you come back here in the in the eighth round and you grab Penix, which if this was a real draft, I would have taken Penix. I had oh, Kirk, get out I, of took, here. I took him in. <laughs> well, I mean, get it's not, and it, 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 things happen if I wasn't in the draft. But if it was a real draft, I would, you know, Kirk would have been replaced with Penix. I would have solved my quarterback problems and have been good. In some drafts, in the ninth round, Penix comes floating back to me. So I was just seeing if I could do that. But th- that's what we do well, in mocks, right? So take take your cursor, go over there, highlight your team again. Mm-hmm. Kirk Cousins seven eleven, Michael Penix eight two instead of Christian Kirk. And that's the play. I mean, if that's that's the super flex way to do a startup. That's the strategy and how to do it. You took you took Kirk at 7'11 as your second quarterback to go with Josh Allen. Obviously, Christian Kirk is a stud wide receiver. He's not Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors, 20 years old or nothing, but he's when he's on the field last year, he's freaking averaging 17 points a game with Trevor Lawrence. And yeah that's a great pick and it the way your team lines up be kind of sitting on your bench that's your fifth player as far as two wide receivers and two flex spots but if you take Christian Kirk out of there and you put Michael Penance in, in your lineup come on now that's a yeah. that's a solid dynasty startup and like you said in a real draft you probably would have done that so yeah, I would have had, um, had to I had to I had to or in, take or take Kirk and then be like hey I I from the for the next three picks I'm trying to trade in to get Michael Penix, right? That's uh, I've been, I yeah. would have had a million trades out all around that area. Cause I want to make two, three picks there. Um, exactly. Exactly. So I think just for the, the mindset on the strategy for my team was I, again, I was being fluid. So, I wasn't, so hold on real quick before you go there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no tight end selection yet, which is not, you know, which is, you know, you, you have to kind of, forego something typically at some point if you want to have certain styles of builds and you, you seem to forego the tight end a little bit but uh the way you played that was was nice right um you, you got I stacked Joku, them. and then you got i, I mean i wasn't and then you got i Likely. wasn't yeah i wasn't thrilled with the njoku pick that was probably my leak my legs least favorite pick to that point there has been two separate like monster tight end runs in the draft so far. And of course I didn't have one. I felt good about my team and just looking at it, obviously, you know, tight ends usually go a little longer and Joku kind of hit his stride last year. Um, they really got something going with and Joku as a security blanket with, as I, obviously he works downfield too. He's really good as a, as a, as a deep receiver from the tight end position, but but they were using the Flacco check down to him. And I think that could be, they could do Flacco. They could do Deshaun Watson check down to Njoku too this year. And I, but also maybe not. And, but I, I didn't feel like I wanted to put him on my team and invest in him over the Amari Coopers and the uh, Deontay Johnson's and the Hollywood Browns at that point, and not knowing what ha- could happen with a tight end, you know, six, seven, Jake Ferguson. Haven't seen him go that early ever. Uh, George Kittle, seven nine. That's a you know he's been going later and later. So that was a good, yeah, uh, a good pick. It's you know, I, I did, you know, I I took Trey Benson over Ingram. Ingram's thirty years old. Trey Benson's a twenty year old running back uh, stud. Uh, you know, I, so I, yeah, I like made if, my. If, if you go to our ADP, Ingram's nine five. Ferguson's eight oh nine. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. So there was, and again, that with the tight end runs in the league. You know, so when, when you, you're playing the, you're playing the league just as much as you're playing with your own mind when you're trying sure. to draft a player. So I did probably got sucked up into, uh, in Njoku there, but I also knew I was in the early ninth. Um, and I've taken him in the ninth and the 10th before. Um, and I, and at that point it's like, all right, well, I knew that my team could use a tight end and I, I don't ever, you know, if I'm, three months away from the season started. I don't care about what team, what my actual team need is, but it kind of lined up correctly for that pick. And it still wasn't the most fun pick, but I think it was very complimentary of the team that I had going so far, but I could have plugged in a bunch of players there and been happy. Mm-hmm. Blake Corum was obvious. Uh, sure. Going with Kyron sure you Williams. Like you said, I'm not, you can't make any trades. If this was a real draft and I had Kyron Williams already, I'm going to be moving around and making sure I get Corum. But I wasn't scared of somebody taking Corum with Tajay Spears on the on the list. You know, mm-hmm. Tajay Spears is is a fun running back who I'd love to have on my team as well. And there were some other running back wide receivers there 
you know, so I wasn't really sweating it whether or not Corum would come back to me. As interesting as it is, and of course it was a box of with you know without you know hundred dollars or one hundred fifty or two hundred dollars on the line, might would have been sweating it a little bit more. Happy to get Corum there, ten ten. That was an easy pick, and just so for people that say, well, you you know, if your your strategy on drafting Kyron is taking Corum, then you're tying up that value of the tenth round pick when you could have taken a Jalen Polk or a Brian Robinson. So now you don't have that, but. Again, if 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 we thought that Kyron Williams wasn't going to miss a game this year, he'd be up in the second round, you know. Mm-hmm. So the complimentary piece of great Blake Corum brings that back. So you get him, you get Kyron at four ten. So yeah, yeah, I did give up a tenth round pick in Corum, but that was the best. That's the best insurance policy in fantasy football this oh, year, I think. Yeah, and it's a it's a later ten, so it's you, you know you could almost call it an eleven, and like that's the again sure. when, we, when we talked about it earlier, like that's that's why I feel comfortable taking. Kyron a little earlier because I can get a, a back that I feel comfortable who's you know a little bit older a little bit more mature had a lot of good run in college and I think he can come in and, and give you some good fantasy points so I think he's on Kyron's level right now absolutely not like I don't think Blake yeah. Corm's gonna come in and do exactly what Kyron Williams doing I do think they're kind of similar players Kyron's been in the league for a year or three at this point and you know has, has I've seen him do it and, and as far as tying up other value, I mean, like you said, it's it's one of the best handcuffs in the entire draft, and really just shores up that hey, you know, I can I can have a solid RB play uh, from, you know, that yeah dra- and, that and draft what- pick I made in the in the fourth round. And let's not sell short the, the, you know, the 12, the 11 other guys in the room. Blake Corum has his fans. It only takes one guy to say, oh, well, this guy's going to be better than Kyron. If you look at what Kyron did last year, Blake Corum's going to be better. I'm going to draft him in the early 10th. You know, you're not guaranteed to get him in the late 10th. I felt good about it. But, uh, you know, all it takes is one person to be like, hey, Blake Corum is a stud and I'm going to take him. And if that happens, if you got Kyron, of course, I'm going to start. I'll try to make a deal with somebody. You know, and then if, if that doesn't work, then by week three, when Kyron is crushing and Corum sitting on that dude's bench, then I'm going to circle back and try to get a deal done before Kyron gets hurt. And then it's too late. Ben, again, th- this is the fluidity of the of the mindset here. At some point here, I know I need wide receiver, but I got Puka, Neighbors, Tank Dale. I got, in my mind, three stud wide receivers that I'm comfortable with. I don't know how in the world I got four running backs through 10 rounds. That never happens, but I love the, what I love the, what I have so far. And I'm like, all right, am I going to take a a Dotson or a Jared Judy? Or, I mean, I was looking at Jermaine Burton, you know, the, the rookie for Cincinnati, but Mm -hmm. in tight end premium, Ben Sennett, an asset again, not, head over heels in love with my Joku nine, three pick, but, but stacking the Ben Senate on top. Now I have some flexibility there and ability to make a trade. Maybe I'm giving away in Joku and Senate in a trade to get a different tight end. But you know, there's a lot of ways to go about that, but I, I did not want to force wide receivers. And uh, we know that wide receivers is a fantastic currency in dynasty, but at the same time, once you get outside that, you know, the first block of 25 or 30 or whatever, they do all become very, very the same, and they 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 become cheaper and cheaper. You know, if Ben mm-hmm. Sennett comes out there, Ben Sennett to me, Ben Sennett doesn't have to do anything this year. But if he were to come out there and have a five catch game anytime soon, he's he's going to be worth way way more than all these wide receivers. Jalen Polk could come out there and have eight catches week one. He's not on the board for me here. I'm just saying as a rookie that doesn't you know it's not way up there in the third, fourth, fifth round. Right. Uh, you know, I just. Uh, the Ben Sennett pick for me was just trying to grab a, 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 an asset to me that could go up in value sooner than later, hold yeah. value for sure. Uh, you know, you could, and, and because I already had the running backs, I wasn't looking at somebody like a sleeper, like a Zach Moss, uh, a Chase Brown, Jalen Wright to, to, you know, some guys that you, you'd actually drafted. And, and honestly, I really was thinking about taking Geno Smith, but it was mm-hmm. because I, I was, I was really thinking about taking Geno. I think that the Seattle Seahawks are going to really take a step forward and Geno's going to yeah. be just fine, but I he's 33, too. 34, you know, 33, 34 years old. And if it didn't go right, then all of a sudden his value plummets. Um, I think it's sure. going to value. I, th- I actually think his value is going to go up a little bit and, and, but he's also attainable. You know, if my team's hitting hard and I need a second quarterback, everything on my team is going right, but I need a quarterback. I could buy a Geno Smith. If something happens and Senate breaks out, I can't buy Senate. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I love I love taking the shot on 
on that rookie tight end. I think that's a good asset uh, around that area for for all the reasons you just stated. You and I know go. we got to go, so I could just hit two yeah. two more items on the way out. Um, uh, there's a lot of up and down on people's thoughts about Isaiah Likely. I thought he obviously showed that he was an NFL caliber star in the making type tight end last sure. year when Mark Andrews got hurt. Who knows how the Ravens are going to play it? He may not be uh, fantasy viable until he moves away from the Ravens, you know. But in the thirteenth round in a tight end premium league, thirteenth, fourteenth round, I'm gonna be looking at. I mean, I did him. I took him at thirteen three here, but it probably had something to do with my team build already. But I'm looking to have Isaiah Likely on as many teams as I can, just because it being dynasty, he's a stud. Uh, the Ravens might not give him enough targets this year to matter, but you know we've already seen it multiple times. Anytime they want to throw him the ball, he catches it and makes plays. He's 24 years old, uh, so I'm just I'm gonna hang on to him every opportunity that I get. And then the going back to only having three wide receivers and just showing one of the reasons I want to talk about this team, obviously the running backs that I don't normally draft and how much fun that was, but bringing it back to like Josh Palmer here and Darnell Mooney. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that that those guys right there are going to buy me time to either a draft wide receivers next year. And again, if this was a real draft, I've traded back a couple of these picks. I could have traded back to get to make these picks happen and I could have some more firepower. But Palmer's set up to get some serious targets for the Chargers this year. And Darnell Mooney right now is the wide receiver, two for the Falcons. You know, yeah. As a couple of years ago, we all loved Darnell Mooney. I know you're a big Darnell Mooney guy. Oh, he sure. Just, you know, you get stuck in a Justin Fields offense with DJ Moore there, and you're not going to get a lot of targets. Right now, the way if the Falcons take off, and of course, I got Penix on this team, and you got your cousins in this league, but Palmer and Mooney give me that flexibility of dirt cheap wide receivers that are going to be on the field getting targets and scoring points. And if yeah. all goes well for me, if all goes well, they're on my bench. And they're mm -hmm. not even starting there, but they're, yeah. they're ridiculously cheap, startable insurance wide receivers. Uh, and I knew when I was taking Penix and it, Jonathan Brooks, Benson, Penix and Joku, Corum, Bit Senate, Daniel Jones, likely. And then Gus Edwards in, at 1410, because I was like, in my mindset was when I took Gus Edwards with that pick was if my team is crushing Gus Edwards could be out there scoring all these touchdowns potentially for the chargers. Why, you know, I could either, if my team isn't doing great, I could probably trade him away and get him a little something or he could be a, a throw in it to make a deal happen. You know, everybody's going to need a running back. Um, right. And, but that was a lot of picks in a row without a wide receiver, but it just kept the, I just didn't see the value on this. I just didn't force it. I could have multiple times and I just, I was, you know, I, I felt Again, in the way I like to play, I have no problems needing action. Wanting a, I, I think I can go if I, I could probably come out of this draft and go get my second next year for Hollywood Brown. You're not going to give it to me because you have Hollywood Brown, but that's the idea. Mm -hmm. I can get out of this draft and trade a second round pick next year for a guy like Hollywood Brown and then immediately bolster my wide receiver core while not her, harming, you know, my assets that I have to move forward with. Yeah. What I would change about this team, especially on the back end here, is I would I'd probably I like the likely pick. I you know I I love the idea of grabbing him in the thirteenth, but for kind of where you were at here, I would have probably won a, a couple more wide receivers. So in that spot, sure. I might have taken Josh Downs at thirteen three, and then instead of Gus, or rather uh, instead of Brandon Allen or Braylon Allen right there, I might have I might have stabbed on a Wandale. Uh, there and went Palmer, Wandell, Mooney, and really would have enjoyed that combination of potential uh, PPR uh, points out of those guys. But that that's kind of the way that I, maybe I would switch that up a little bit, and maybe I would take a rookie in, in like the Jalen McMillan instead of Gus Edwards at at, at that sure. spot and, and light up the blue real heavy at the at the back end of this. Maybe it, no, maybe a Jacoby a Myers um, instead of likely and or Downs there. Somebody I know that I feel like is going to be a featured wide receiver too, uh, and get some catches there. So that, but, but other well, than that, me, you know, I'm definitely, I'm definitely taking likely over Jacoby Myers, but I like the Josh Downs call out, but I also wide, could wide have done that, 24 last year, my wide receiver 24 last year. He ran hot on some touchdowns. I got, ah. I, I could have, I could have easily, I could easily take into Tavia Wicks where you're telling me to take Josh Downs. Um, mm -hmm. I think Wicks has a really good shot to, to continue to, 
to escalate here. Uh, there's not. I thought right now, and by this time in this uh, in the off season, that he would have more uh, fanfare. Uh, mm-hmm. There was definitely a little drum beat right after the season, and I thought that he would be higher than the 14th round at this point. Um, and even you know, even looking, I could have taken Dubs at, at that at that price tag. You could take Romeo Dubs and and John sure. Tavian Wicks, you know, he, back he, here he, together. Yeah. And and the way I'm going to really play it is I'm going to have a couple of more picks back here anyway because I'm going to trade up in some spots and I'm going to trade down in some spots. So I'll probably be in the real draft. I'll probably have two 12s and two 13s, you know, mm-hmm. um, and be able to manipulate this a little bit different back here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, you know, again, you're, you're at the end of a mock draft. You're, you're sure. trying to – I'm trying to do the best that I can to use this as something to sh- talk about on the show. But at the same mm-hmm. time, you're working and you're like, oh, man, I just I made a decision to take Gus Edwards. Jalen McMillan, McMillan was actually the guy that I wanted there just so you could talk about him and tell yeah. me how good he was. And then he's the next pick. You know, when that when that, when you pass on a guy and he's next pick, is that is there any worse feeling? Yeah, no, no. All right. Well, let's let's wrap this up. We can uh, we appreciate you for for tuning in. If you're listening on the podcast, hit up with a five star review. If you're watching on on the tubes, hit us with a subscribe comment below on on what you like, what you didn't like. You can hit us up on Patreon with a five dollar holler and you get uh, at least three extra episodes a month, uh, as well as access to the discord ADP that we've been referencing. We do a lot of mocks, which is one of these. Um, and we we uh, are have have just about updated the dynasty rankings. So we've got a lot of stuff over there for your pleasure. Make sure you go check it out. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace.